Own Your Crown Virtual Boot Camp. Um, can everyone see me? Hi, Rebecca. Morning, Carol. Hi, hi, hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's wonderful to have you guys this morning. So to all the wonderful ladies that are tuning in this morning, um, we as Own Your Crown have been running this series of virtual events where we basically want to empower you, teach you new skills. Um, obviously now with the COVID-19 pandemic and all the changes that have taken place globally, we just want you to be able to hit the ground running. So today our focus is on starting a side hustle and we have an exciting lineup of speakers with Rebecca and Carol taking over from me just now. I just wanted to give you a warm welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. So hi everyone, um, as Tendai said, you know, at Own Her Crown, we're really trying to empower you. So we're talking about starting that side hustle. And from my, uh, my history in being, starting a side hustle started off from working in IT, corporate, and I had 20 years of experience working in, in the corporate world and in leadership. But when I started volunteering with entrepreneurs, um, with part of my leadership roles was to mentor and coach individuals. That's where I kind of found that these were things that I loved doing without getting paid extra for them. And that's where I started trying to figure out what's the meaning of this passion that I have. And then I kind of leaned on to the fact that after learning and discovering what my purpose was, I realized this was one of the things that I wanted to do as a side hustle. So even on weekends, I would do talks um, for women's events. And then later on, when I left corporate to become an entrepreneur, that's when I decided to only focus on the leadership development for individuals, coaching and mentorship. So that's how I kind of discovered my side hustle. So Karel, thank you so much for joining us. You are a man with lots of experience, lots of knowledge. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we've all, I personally gained from your um, coaching style, your teaching style. If you can share with us a little bit about how you kind of discovered your side hustle and, um, and how it became a full-time or you're still doing a side hustle. Tell us a little bit about how you do your work. Okay. Um, you... All right. Um, well, like you, Rebecca, I spent about 20 years in the, in the corporate environment. And this was mostly in the logistics and the transport sector. Um, we then, uh, in 2013, 2014, I decided, okay, now these things that I've been learning and applying throughout my career in, in, in leadership positions throughout Africa, m most of it I spent in Zambia, Uganda, and Mozambique. Uh, only a little bit of it was in South Africa itself. Um, I, I felt drawn to, to spend more time in, in working as a coach and empowering people in their leadership styles and their leadership journeys. Uh, and, and that's where I took the, took the step to, to leave the corporate environment and start the, the side hustle, which was not easy at all. Uh, it was a new industry, a new line completely. Um, so it took quite a bit of effort, a lot of failures, but uh, eventually it worked out. Oh, fantastic. No, thanks for sharing with us. So what are some of the pitfalls um, that you've seen when people start doing a side hustle? Because I've seen that a lot of people do it out of passion. So I used to get opportunities mm. to volunteer and work through people's business plans when I was um, volunteering for entrepreneurship development as a um, corporate citizenship um, responsibility agenda and mm. I found that people were so into their product or the idea that they actually kind of like missed the point um, or you could actually see as a judge you could see the pitfalls that were waiting ahead of them so instead of bursting people's bubbles I mean we're here to encourage you but we have to show you the reality as well of what happens within running your own business so can you share with us a little bit of what the pitfalls are? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the, the very first one that I came across was, by definition, a side hustle is not the main thing that feeds you and your family and pays your rent. A side hustle is something you do on the side to either supplement your, your income or maybe you're deciding, like I did, that uh, what I was doing 
was not really fulfilling and I had to find something else. Now, the key thing to remember is your day job remains king when it's a side hustle. Your day job is at least for the first few months, unless you're a genius and you've got a magic product, your, your side hustle will just be to supplement. So your main job is still going to pay the rent, put food on the table uh, and support your family. So you must decide right from the onset, how much time do you have available not in any po at any point sacrificing what you're doing in your day job. How much free time do you have to spend on your side hustle? Mm. If you do your work for your side hustle during working hours and you're using your employer's time, their resources, uh, uh, it's, it's as good as theft, I think. <laughs> it's perhaps wow. harsh to put it like that, but it is. <laughs> they are paying you to represent them and do work for them. So if you do other work on their time, that's a little bit unethical. Um, so I would always suggest go speak to your, your manager, mm. your immediate manager. Go say to them, look, this is what I want to do. It will not interfere in any way with my job that I do here. And of course, when you mm. make that promise, you must be sure that it's not going to interfere <laughs> and that it's not in competition <laughs> with mm. your employer. You can't go work exactly. against them. Yeah. Right? So, so that's the, the very first key thing I think that we need to consider. Wow. Very sound advice there, Karel. And um, so we've put up a poll where we're asking people, do you currently have a side hustle? So um, people use different terms and I love how you explain the definition of what a side hustle is, is you do have a main job and you want to start a side um, business, or maybe you are a full-time parent and you want to start a side business. So it's not the thing that the main business and mm -hmm. um but what are some of for me pitfalls that i've seen as well um absolutely the the point of don't quit your day do day job um because that's where the because many individuals complain about not having enough capital to run a business so they you know emotionally make a decision to just jump into being a full-time entrepreneur without having the solid building blocks in place and then you'll find that you're struggling. So definitely keep your day job. It'll kind of inject some of the finances that you need mm -hmm. um, for running your side hustle. So on the pitfalls, what are some of the um, unrealistic expectations that people have regarding a side hustle that you've observed? They're going to be loaded. Everyone thinks that, yeah, like, you, like you explained earlier, when, when people start their side hustle, say they they are so on fire and passionate about it. They love their product and they stand behind their product. You know, they will, you can see that they truly believe in what they are doing or what they are selling. Mm. But by doing that, we often become a little bit unrealistic uh, in our expectations. We, we think it's going to be easy, which it never is. It takes a lot of hard work, time and dedication. Um, the, the old saying, blood, sweat, and tears, uh, for a side hustle, it's, <laughs> it's very much the truth. So you need to be realistic. You always expect that you're going to make so much money so fast. Mm. Or, I think when we all start out, and I know I did this, I, I bounced the idea of leaving the, the field that I was in to get into, into coaching and leadership development. I bounced it off a, a lot of close friends and people whose opinion I mattered. Uh, or I valued, sorry. And everyone said to me, wow, you're going to be brilliant. This is going to be so good. Mm -hmm. So when I started, I immediately thought I'm going to make so much money. Within three <laughs> months, I'm going to leave my, my day job. <laughs> I'm going to live in this mansion. I'm going to drive a smart mm -hmm. car. I'm going to be famous. Um, and, and when you set yourself up with such massively high expectations, the, the moment you hit that first hurdle, you, you get the wind completely knocked out of you and you, you take that step back and say, bah, this must have been a mistake. Maybe I should leave it. So expectations must be realistic. And that ties in with doing your homework. Yeah. Look at what is in the market right now. Look at what, what people are looking for. Um, what do people need? And can you meet that need? And then once you've seen whether the product is there, you, you have to decide, is this really, really what I love? Is this something I'm going to enjoy? If you're going mm -hmm. to take time, your free time that you have now will become your side hustle time. So if you're going to give up watching Netflix, going out with friends, uh, lying in the sun to get a tan on a weekend or whatever, 
if you're going to give that up for something, you have to love the thing that you're going to do. It has to be your mm-hmm. passion. You must uh, lie four o'clock in the morning, lie in bed and thinking, can I get up now? Can I get started? It must never yeah. be a case where you don't really love it. And yeah. by seven in the morning, you're thinking, oh gosh, do I have to get up to do this? That should never be <laughs> how it is. So clear expectations, which is supported mm. by proper planning. Wow. So besides just, and I'd like the way you led to the topic of purpose now, where you were saying, mm. you know, if you don't love what you do, then it's going to be very challenging. I found that whenever at work I was working and then they would ask me to be a spokesperson for, let's say, women's event. And I was really thinking like, but this is not my main job, but I would mm. drop, the, you know, like in a minute I would be there. I would even fund my own transportation. One time I remember um, everyone that's listening, there was this um, talking opportunity in Durban and my work schedule was kind of tricky that time. And I remember leaving and I couldn't get a flight because the flight, by the time it would land, then I needed, I was the keynote speaker at this innovation summit for in, in Durban. And I thought to myself, okay, Rebecca, we're going to find a way to win this thing. So I got my driver. We left at two in the morning from Johannesburg. He drove me. So we used my car. I slept in the back, got there. Um, stopped by a gas station and then changed my clothes, then got in, did the talk, got back again in the car and drove back to Joburg. It was insane. And I'm thinking to myself, Rebecca, what are you doing? But I found it so fulfilling. So sometimes you do take risks. Um, There's the passion that drives you. But I think that's where you start getting feedback from people and saying, you know, this is what you're good at. But I think purpose has to be one of the key anchors to your side hustle, um, besides just the fact that you want to make extra money. Because also that money is attached to a value. So maybe you're trying to say education is important. That's why I'm doing the side hustle so Mm. I can get money to pay for my to further my education so what's that aspect of purpose carol can you maybe unpack that for us when it comes to doing side hustles as well well the the thing for me is always that uh, if you do something that you love and you enjoy it it Mm. naturally comes easy to you it's not Mm. something that you have to spend a lot of time on Um, what you said there is maybe education is important for someone so the side hustle will support that once you know what your passion or your purpose is, it doesn't mean that you have to, you have to do your side hustle within that field, but it must support mm-hmm. your, your okay. passion or your purpose. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, it must never become the main thing and take away from your purpose. We are here for a reason. Uh, and, and there are many ways that we, that we can go about discovering our purposes. But just as a quick assessment for yourself and for everybody watching, or or listening to this, look at what people compliment you on, what you are good at. You said that. Someone said to you, you're good at this, Rebecca. So uh, for myself as well, from the earliest times that I can, my my first time someone said to me, you should be speaking. I was in the sixth grade and I had to do a presentation in front of the class. And I I can't remember the topic at all. Um, But I was standing in front of the class and the teacher, when we were done, said to me, you know what, no matter what your content is, as long as you always speak to people like that, they will listen. So oh, that is man. what you should do. And I ignored that. I, I always used to just brush off compliments and, you know, hide shyly. And, but things like that kept on coming through my whole life. So go look back at your, your history. Look, look at what people have told you. Cooking, maybe that should be your side hustle. During this COVID time now, there are so many people that have started a side hustle to do with cooking and delivering food to people Mm -hmm. um, to make a little bit of extra money, baking cakes or whatever the case is. But listen to what people have told you you're good at. Think about what you enjoy, what gets you excited. Uh, If someone says to me, this weekend we are going to go do construction, I'm going to go, yo okay, I'll help you because you're a, you're a good friend and I, I think it's a good idea. But as you walk up to it, you think, yeah, you know, I could be watching rugby or soccer right now. And maybe, you know, that, that next episode on Netflix, you know, would be much more exciting. Then that's not your passion. Mm-hmm. It's a thing that you're willing to put everything else aside for. The thing that gets your heart beating faster. Uh, 
and and there are way, official or, or, or structured ways to discover that. And you, as someone who deals with people in visions, with the vision mm-hmm. boards and all those things that you do, you know that once you've got, once you pay attention to it, it's easy to find your yeah. your passion. And if you work within your passion, you don't get discouraged so easy, so easily. Yeah. It's if you're doing something that you're not really loving. Um, and something goes wrong, it's very easy to put your hands up and say, okay, I've had enough, what's next? But if it's something you really love, if it's your passion, if it's the reason you live, no matter what comes and you you bash against that wall, you'll just find a different way to get around it. Um, Uh, I I have a good friend and a client who has bumped into so many walls in his journey to fulfill his purpose time and time again, but he never, never gives up always smiling, always positive, always looking for that next angle to make his, uh, or to to get him closer to his purpose. So find your purpose and the discouragement will be less, your passion will Mm -hmm. be more and it will be so easy to do. Wow. So how, for me, um, when you say, you know, there's some things that you don't enjoy. So Mm -hmm. I think also it's important for people to understand there's some elements of what you do that you don't enjoy, but it doesn't mean the overall idea is wrong completely so for example uh, i think for us you know when we do coaching there's an admin aspect of you know the business so there's a grunge work of writing reports and everything like that so if you hate the admin part it does not so try not to get so fixated on the activities that you really don't enjoy then they end up overwhelming you and then you feel like maybe it's not what i'm supposed to be doing and then you misguide maybe out of being misguided um, Mm -hmm. or you're just too immersed on the negative side then you end up quitting on something that could have been actually also a good idea yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they, I, you mentioned admin. I absolutely despise admin. But when you do start by yourself, you'll have to do your own invoicing. You'll have to do your own banking and your SARS documents. And if you're going to go that big, of course, if it's just a hobby, then it's a different story. But these things are not fun. And in the beginning, you cannot afford to appoint uh, an accounting firm to do your three invoices a month when you start. It's senseless. You, you have to do those things, but do them seeing the, the purpose that they are fulfilling and in, in, yeah. within your purpose. If I don't invoice a client, I don't get paid. If I don't re- write a report to give them their feedback, I don't give them the service that I want them to pay for. Mm-hmm. If I don't do marketing, if I don't sell myself, because that's one of the less fun things to do for, for many people. I know I don't like it, um, but I must realize that if I don't do that, I won't get the client. If I don't get the client, I won't get paid. And if I don't get paid, I'll have to stay in my day job forever and never be able to fully spend my time in, in walking in my purpose. So, yeah. so you have to take those things as they come. Yeah, very good point. And I think even with our day jobs as well. (laughs) Yeah, even with our day jobs as well, the full time jobs as well, I think that's another thing where especially Mm. when you start getting in in the flow of your side hustle, don't like um, in the book by um, Cheryl Sandberg um, from Lean In, she says, don't leave until it's time to leave, right? So don't quit um, prematurely. So maybe yes. now you don't enjoy your everyday job. You're now complaining about the pressurized timelines or now with COVID having to work from home and it's nonstop, mm. go, go, go. So I think it's also important to keep that to balance as well to say, even if you don't really enjoy your full-time job, still find the purpose, find the purpose. Exactly. See the, see the necessity in having that uh, full-time job. If you, if you cannot see that I need it to do what I love, it's easy to start thinking negatively about it. And, and it's all in a mindset. Yeah. If you get yeah. up every morning saying, oh gosh, I would much rather be doing my side gig than my day job. You're going to start encouraging your mind and your body every single day to not want to be there. So wow. when you get up in the morning or even at night before you go to bed, um, just say a little rhyme in your, in your head. I'm excited to get up for work tomorrow because if I work hard, I'll get paid and I can follow my dream. And, and you yeah. can word that in any way, you know, whatever works for you. But try and step away in, in your self-talk from speaking negatively about your day job, speaking negatively about 
the problems you have there because that is the only thing that's enabling you to do this. Mm -hmm. Unless you have a really rich daddy or husband or wife that's willing to say, all right, here you go, half a million rand. Off you go, go start your side gig, leave your day job. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I yeah, think most, like, most of us are not that blessed. <laughs> <laughs> we all dream of that, but the reality is yeah. no one is coming, right? To, to just exactly. land that. And I like what exactly. you mentioned about positive affirmations, where you really have to get your mind right in setting the, the tone for the day and mm -hmm. how you're going to step in. But like I say, in seeing the necessity of something. And I think that brings us to like things like gratitude that we talked about um, on Own Your Crown platform. Right. We're saying, you know, be grateful for that job because the clothes you're wearing, maybe it's because of that salary you're earning, the roof over your head, you're able to pay, pay rent mm. um, because of that salary that's coming in. So maybe the conditions might not be so, so rosy, but you're seeing the necessity in just pushing through and being positive. So which one is going to take us to the next point now to say, um, you know, from a more technical side, um, you know, with some of the side hustles, according to Henley um, report, they're saying that there are certain professions that are really good for side hustles. Um, they're saying professional business services is one of them. So, you know, especially like what you're in, the coaching mm. side, maybe it's accounting, uh, marketing, and then they've got real estate as a side hustle. I'm sure some of some people also have been thinking right now with the interest rates being low and the housing market is definitely a buyer's market. It's not the seller's market, but definitely a buyer's market. And then there's also um, teaching, lecturing and mm -hmm. tutoring. Um, that's also a really great um, side hustle that was listed. Investments is another side hustle. And we learned that through the financial um, man management session that we had um, on this platform as well. Then another one is selling and buying goods. Um, so this can be in the form of um, buying maybe a product and you, you mark up the price and then sell it. And then on the digital space now with COVID and the lockdown, I think a lot of it has been pushed now on the social media platforms as well mm. as um, you know your influencer kind of gigs. So later on, we're gonna have a speaker who's gonna cover a bit on the digital side of how you market or sell your products. Um, Karel, um, on the aspect of knowing exactly what you want, how important is it to actually have more, but maybe a mini business plan where you, let's say you pick any of these ideas to run with, yeah. um, just to make sure that you kind of flesh out, like you mentioned this, you need to do research but um, that also comes in the form of a business plan. Yes, definitely. Look, the, a lot of people will think that for a side hustle to do business plan um, is a waste of time. And maybe if it is something you do just as a hobby, then doing a business plan is not really necessary. And it doesn't have to be a business plan of 120 pages because I've some, right. seen some really, really big and complex oh. things, you know, <laughs> with 10 years of research in and my goodness, but you have to plan. There are simpler ways of doing it. There's a, a process called the business model canvas, um, mm. which we also teach and help clients with from time to time, which gives a, a bit of a graphical idea um, of what your business layout should be and what you should look at, where you look at your customers, where you look at your services, uh, your competitors, your partners, your pricing model, uh, your channels on how you are going to communicate or sell your product to your potential mm -hmm. clients uh, and your revenue streams. And, and these are all things that you, you must consider before you start. It, you can not just walk into it because you will miss things, not in some way reduced it into a plan. It can be as simple as a two pager. Mm -hmm. I want to deliver a service ABC these are the people I want to deliver it to. This is what it's going to cost me to do that. And this is what I want to get paid to do that. It could really be as simple as that, but you have to write it down. Also to make it clear to you, if you have the skill sets to fit into those things, sometimes having a passion doesn't mean that you have the skills to do it. Uh, I might love to influence people, but I might get stage fright every time I speak to more than five people. That is yeah. a skill I have to then develop. I might love food. I might be a, a crazy foodie, but I can't cook to save my life. That is a skill I have to then learn. 
before I can step into it. So it helps you map out the way that you're going to go. So you don't to the day that you start that you're not all over the place. Mm. Being all over the place is confusing. It's stressful. Uh, it can very easily discourage you because everything feels like it's just way too much. Mm. But if you plan, you know, all right, fine. First things first, let me get this one done. Then let me do this. Then that is the next step. And then it's a, lo it's a lot easier to feel that you're moving forward as well. You can sort of track your progress. So the, a business plan in any shape or form is very important. Wow. Yeah. So on the business plan side, when it comes to the financials, uh, many people mm -hmm. project, you know, it's like we talked about, that it's going to be an overnight success. What are some of the practical steps that one can take in selling their product? So, because half the time you find the first wave of your, you're launching your business. Mm -hmm. It's always the friends, the family, the cousins, the aunties who will support it. And then after that, you yes. find a lot of people <clears throat> feel stuck. It's like, okay, now who's going to buy the product? Right. So, okay. so that not, not only just in the costing part, right? Before you set your price, you need to know what it has cost you to build your business, to get it to where you are. And you must not just budget or, or set your selling price on the basis of what you have actually spent because you really want to make money out of this. Now one starts a side hustle to, to sponsor people. If it's not, if you're not going to make money from it, it's not a side hustle, it's charity. Mm. And <laughs> if you, if you, are going to do a charity as a side hustle, then obviously you already have enough money. So <laughs> be very clear on what it's going to cost you to deliver your service. And this takes us back to the business plan again. Know who's going to buy. Mm -hmm. Don't count that just selling to your family and friends and leveraging your network is going to support you forever. Um, your product has to be good enough. Um, your price has to be appropriate to the value that you are giving people. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if you are simply teaching someone how to slice bread straight, what value is that really adding to them? Can you mm -hmm. charge 199 Rand on an online course of straight bread slicing um, to, to get people to pay for that? Perhaps not. But if you can show someone how to save 80% on their electricity bill every month, mm -hmm. then that someone might be willing to pay for. So, in, and, and that again is where the business plan comes in. Know what you're going to sell. The research has to be there to show that there's a space for that. Mm -hmm. uh, if I want to sell uh, toilet paper, okay, at the, at the start of COVID, selling toilet paper was a really good idea, but I think most people have caught on that that's not a good idea. But mm -hmm. <laughs> if I go now and I want to sell toilet paper, where is the market for that? Mm -hmm. Is my product better than the Twin Saver or Everfresh or whatever that you're buying in, in Checkers or Pick and Pay? So research the product and by doing that, you understand what it's going to cost you, uh, what your market is for it and what you then can charge for it. Mm. Wow. Yeah, so I think on the selling side as well, it takes a lot of discipline too, right? And almost some kind of bravery to put yourself out there when it comes to selling. So one thing that I've found um, individuals who try to sell online, they almost like are preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. So you find that maybe they will post, have an Instagram page and then they'll post their product and then they will kind of, so the same people who follow them are the ones who get to see that product unless mm -hmm. if there, there's a call to action. So what are some of the simple ways or practical ways that a person who might be selling a service or a product um, can get their the word out there and reach to people who are outside their normal market. Obviously we're going to go deeper into that from a marketing perspective, mm -hmm. but I think some people do on the, on the chat already have side hustles, but they're stuck with the fact that, okay, no one else is buying and what am I doing wrong? The, the key is the one that you mentioned bravery. I, I think it's one of the most difficult things to do. Uh, and for more than one reason, when you go out to sell, selling on social media, I think is easy, right? Mm -hmm. You create an ad, you boost a post, <clears throat> you create engagement on social media where people interact and say, oh, wow, this is cool. How much is it? And, you know, all things like that. But the real sales, unless you're selling uh, an online service, uh, the real sales get done by you walking up to people face to face. Now, mm -hmm. 
The scary part there is, <clears throat> excuse me, you've got your dream in your hands, your passion. You, know, you believe you've got the perfect product and you have to go up to someone and say, buy this. Mm. And they will say, ew, why? And immediately when you get negative feedback, you're like, oh, maybe, maybe I'm not that good. Maybe, maybe, maybe my product is not that good. So that discouragement is the thing that scares most of us away, that reject, uh, reject, rejection, sorry. And that's where you have to be brave. It is easy to pump up numbers on social media, but unless you can reach that point where you convert a like or a comment into a sale, no matter what you are selling, that's a difficult part. And I'm going to stay online to wait for the marketing part and the sales part because the, that, that's one of the things that I, because I don't like going to people and saying, this is what I offer as a service. Um, and there are different ways that you can do it. The, the multi-level marketing method of selling, you offer something for free. When they like it, then they can pay for something more. Um, but that has become so common in, in the industry that a lot of people have become weary of that. Uh, mm. If I'm ever offered uh, a free ticket to a seminar, a two hour seminar on how to convert your free time into millions, yeah. I'm immediately skeptical. Um, mm. Mm. So I would just say that you, by the business plan process, uh, whether you do a, a traditional way of the, or the business model canvas, by really knowing who your target market is, you will know how to approach them. Is it an industry where you can send an email with a rate better than your competitor and they will buy into it? Like you said, with the professional services. Is it a physical product someone has to see, touch, feel? Understand what you're selling and understand who you are selling to. And, and that should then help you identify a little bit easier how you have to go about that. But it's not fun. I, I don't like the selling part. <laughs> yeah, so definitely. So doing a side hustle obviously gets you out of your comfort zone, even though sure. it's something that you're passionate about. Um, so I think that's one thing. And I think what you said was very critical way we're saying people do get skeptical of certain like get rich, quick, easy kind of schemes. However, I think another element for um, people who want to do a side hustle, which they need to consider is that time to reflect and review their performance. I think many times people want to pretend or ignore the message that's coming through the data. Mm -hmm. So the data will show you like, okay, you only sold two for X amount of money and you did that last month and last month was zero. And then we kind of pretend that we're okay. So sometimes um, I think having your own personal business review sessions um, mm -hmm. is very important so you can understand the performance, why you're successful or why you're not successful or understanding that it's a long marathon ahead, that you need to be patient in um, cultivating the rewards that you're looking for. Um, what I did personally, when I started my side hustle, I worked um, for m most of the time um, where I didn't get paid. I was offering it as a free service to test the market because I personally wasn't sure about my idea for my side hustle. I really mm. was a little bit, um, it was unfamiliar territory for me. Um, I knew my vision was to impact people's lives, but I didn't realize that I would need to go into entrepreneurship to do that. And then when I decided to say, okay, let me see if I'm actually good at this. You know, I know that I'm, I know the book knowledge, I've got the experience in working, running business units in companies, um, which means that I have to be profitable. Um, so that means if I can do it within corporate environment, then I can do it in a personal environment. So that's entrepreneurship compared to entrepreneurship. Mm. Um, but in doing my side hustle, I found that when I did things for free, then those people would refer me to someone else um, without me asking them to refer. Mm. So that it was more where I needed that validation to know that I'm on the right track. But like you said, you know, you get feedback. Some people might not agree with what you're doing or like what you're doing. But I think if 80% of the people keep saying, you know, this is beneficial, they show you um, tangible results in how you've impacted them, then I really found the strength to carry on. And then later mm -hmm. on, then I decided to price my products. And then later on, then I went to, I wasn't pricing them as high. Um, because I wasn't also um, targeting the high end um, 
candidates. And like you said, you need to know who you're targeting. So know who this person is. What do they do when they wake up? Is this the kind of person that will buy my product? So mm -hmm. then I started fine tuning even my own um, elevator pitch, you know, through that experience yes. as well. Because <laughs> when people used to ask me, what do you do? I would just ramble on because I didn't, I wasn't, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, did I even make sense to, as to what I'm doing? So you will have those seasons of um, uncertainty or even just doubting your own, you know, offerings. But I think as you stay consistent, I think one of the things that I also found that helped me with my side hustle to become a full-time hustle was um, to stay consistent in how I delivered. So if I'm selling this, I continuously <clears throat> sell it on, mm. on and on and on. Instead of people will now next day, they see me, Rebecca is selling pots. And then the next minute, Rebecca is now selling flowers. What's going on <laughs> with Rebecca? You know, so I also had to um, navigate my way around it because then I found there were buy products out of the main core business idea that I had. So also don't be afraid to add on the, the side um, um, hustles as well, which are, which come as a byproduct of the side hustle. Yes. I think that's also important. Um, but as long as it's not pulling you into five different tangents, and like you said before, where you end up being confused, anything you want to add to that, Karel? Yeah, just you, you, you said there about the consistency. John Maxwell says that, Success mm -hmm. is, uh, is not achieved in a day, it is achieved daily, which means mm -hmm. you, when you start your side hustle, it is not going to be successful from the word go. Um, so you have to stay at it, stay consistent and stay true to what you believe in, stay true to your, your purpose and your passion, that product that you want to put out there. You, you, you said that one day you're selling pots and pans and the next day you're selling something else. If you're going to do that, you will always only touch on that little first part of opening the door for success. And then you'll step out into something else that looks like it might work faster, but stick to what you love and stick to that, that thing of your purpose and be consistent about it every single day. Um, I, when, when I started getting active on social media, um, other than posting pictures of puppies and, and my daughter and, and actually trying to sell things or promote myself online, when you are consistent, and then this you'll pick up very quickly when you do it yourself. If every day you post something, slowly you start seeing the numbers and the engagement increasing. Mm -hmm. Skip a week and you have to start right from the beginning again. You don't post, put a post again and you have your 150 likes that you had on your last post of two weeks ago. You'll start with two likes. Mm -hmm. And then after two, three days, it'll be four likes and a few more comments. So consistency is very important and and your clients also need to see that you are out there consistently if you are selling and you know you're only converting one out of 20 people then how many people do you need to see hmm. you can't now because you have one client stop selling you have to sell again to 20 people to get the one person that's going to pay you for tomorrow so the consistency is very very important and the free part works but there also lies a pitfall within that, or that lies within a pitfall, um, in that you could end up doing things for free forever. Mm. You must be very clear mm. on up to which point will you provide the service for free, uh, because there are people that will abuse that. They will bring you back time and time again. No, but this is now really good. I think let's do it one more time. Before you know it, you've done thousands of rands worth of work for them, and you've not mm. been paid a cent. So decide what your value is and value yourself. If you're out there and if they're willing to get you there for free, obviously they, what you're giving them is valuable. Otherwise they wouldn't even ask you if it was free, mm. but draw the line and say, okay, guys, now you need to start paying. Don't fall into that habit of, okay, but it's good exposure for too long. We do need to put it out there for free. You do give them a little teaser. Um, in the coaching, we do lunch and learns. So you go to a company, you say, bring all your people into the boardroom give me 45 minutes, I will give them a session for free, absolutely for free, um, on leadership or on conflict, uh, whatever you feel you need for your people right now. And if I walk out at the end of the session and you don't like it, and your people were not motivated and empowered, I won't call you again. But if they like it and if they're positive and feel empowered afterwards, you will give me 30 minutes 
to make a proposal to you. So mm -hmm. that's a nice way of doing it. You set the condition before the time. Don't just do it for free, but do it for free saying this one is for free, but there will be more that we can offer and you'll have to pay for it. Yeah, very good advice. I remember I was coaching a young um, individual who did photography and they offered something for free. And then we said, okay, out of the free, then they need to have that person who gets the free product to mm. refer maybe two friends who will pay, maybe even if it's at a discount, <clears throat> but at least they're paying customers. So if they like it, then obviously they will um, enjoy that. So Sophia saying brilliant point, Karel. Um, so when it comes to the whole um, not monetizing your product, mm. but also making sure that you make it profitable after a while, but also using the free time to your advantage. So for example, what I also did, if there was a talk or a conference where they did not pay the full amount, then I would use that to say, okay, let me market um, what people can also expect from me. Um, mm -hmm. from a services perspective. And then I'd find maybe I would get individuals who wanted coaching out of the talk because they got to see me, they got to trust me and they right. feel comfortable enough to, to ask me to coach them. So, um, so Karel, how can people get in touch with you um, when it comes to your business offerings and what do you actually offer as a service? Okay. So um, my website uh, is kmld.online. Mm -hmm. Um, Facebook, KMLD online and uh, Twitter, Twitter is a little bit longer. So just, <laughs> just go to Facebook and the website. Um, I offer coaching services uh, and consulting for individuals and businesses. I like working with people who have a dream, they have a passion and we guide them in the coaching process to realize or to, to first identify that passion and then to take the steps towards reaching the passion. It's, it's not about telling you what your passion is, uh, because that is within you. Each and every single person has their own thing that they want, their own purpose in life. Um, so you, you can pop onto the website at any time on Facebook, leave a message. Uh, on the website, there are set services that, uh, that you can sign up for there and book. Uh, I do offer a free one hour um, session. It's not a coaching session. It's a discovery session mm -hmm. where we both speak to each other uh, or as a team, whether that's a business or an individual, we, we have a conversation where I will ask certain questions and through the discovery session, we will discover um, yeah. whether I can add value to you and whether you are willing to participate uh, in, in the sessions. Uh, right. I'd, I'd love to, to, to see a few people pop on there and uh, you, see Carol. who we can help. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen the results. I've seen people that um, I've personally met through you, how you've impacted them and they're doing some amazing stuff in the community and in their businesses. So there's a great question that came up. Um, so we're mm -hmm. going to close off with questions and answers. So question was around time management. So if you think oh, of dear. it, uh, <laughs> I'm working hard and then there's a side hustle. How mm -hmm. do I manage the time? There's not enough time in a day. Th that, that's the part where you need to be able to speak to your, your employer, number one, so that they know that come five o'clock in the evenings, you will need to step away. So they need to know you're doing something else. You need to be very clear on how much effort you're going to need to put into your side hustle. And then the most important part, and the thing that often can make or break things is speak to your family and your friends. Mm. If you're married, speak to your wife or your husband, your kids, or your partner, because the time you spend with them at the dinner table or sitting on the couch chatting is going to disappear. You have to get them to buy into your dream. When they do that, then managing your time becomes easy because there's no one nagging in the background. Are you doing this again? You never spend time with me anymore. Uh, <laughs> we've all been there. And then be very clear, set time blocks. Uh, use time management systems like the Eisenhower matrix, uh, which you can just go and Google. Uh, it's a very simple method of deciding what is important to get done now and which things are just taking up time and not really moving me forward. And then be willing to make the sacrifice. If you say, oh, I can never get up early, forget about that. If you mm. get up 10 minutes before work after snoozing the alarm for 20 times, if that is your attitude, first change that before you start your side hustle. 
Yeah. Because your side hustle yeah. will take time and you must be willing to make that sacrifice. Wow. So I think also because I noticed with time management, you know, the working moms and then you got all these things to juggle. Um, I started like doing a lot of research on time management because I also, when I did vision board sessions with people, I'd ask mm. them what's holding you back from not starting what you say you want to do. Um, then they would say it's time management most of the time. Mm. And so when it comes to time as well, I think the time blocks definitely work. Put a time block for family time, put a time mm -hmm. block for your side hustle. Because even research has shown that if people do what they call deep work, deep work philosophy refers to allocating 60 to 90 minutes of really focused mm. work on that one thing that you need to do. So if it's setting up the business plan, allocate 60, 90 minutes undisturbed and you just go at it. Unlike where you're trying to do a little bit here, then you get distracted there and then you're trying to multitask. I think that's where quite a few people do run into mm. the challenge of time. Um, what I also did um, is that even if you, let's say at work, um, if you come in at work an hour early, you sit maybe somewhere in your car or in the break room and then put your earphones on, maybe watch a YouTube video because maybe at home it's quite disrupt. Um, there are a lot of distractions. Um, mm -hmm. That could be a way for you to, but you're not using company uh, material, but you're actually using your, your time a little bit more wisely. And exactly. um, so another question that popped in, um, Karel, was around um, the disclosure factor. Um, they're saying, do you really, really have to disclose to your um, to your manager? So I'll kind of answer that in part, and then you can take it away. Sure. Um, so personally, when I sign my contract um, with a company, I you read through the contract. So most contracts will either say you are allowed to start a side mm. business as long as it's not in competition with the company that you work for. So make sure that it's not something where you're taking intellectual capital and you're using templates from the company to do your side business and it's competing um, on that on that aspect. And then um, another thing that I picked up was um, when it comes to disclosure, some people do have vindictive and evil and mean bullying mm. kind of leadership teams where they don't <laughs> want you to succeed in anything. So it's a little bit scary to even disclose that. So um, I think there comes a point of discretion where you might need to do your thing on the side. Um, there's some opportunities that I would actually go for in speaking engagements that I didn't share with my manager all the time. Um, sometimes I'll be nominated to travel. Um, then I would have to ask for permission. Mm -hmm. So um, then they knew that I was doing some things on the side, but I would say, okay, how do I promote the company or how do I promote a product that they want us to promote? Or maybe I use it as a networking opportunity to bring in right. um, clients to the business. So Karel, anything you want to add to that? It, it, it really is about the legalities. Um, if you have a non-compete uh, clause in your contract, um, and let's say you do offer a service on your side hustle that is in line or side by side with what your main job does, so they can shut you down legally within minutes. Uh, it's, it's very simple for them to do that. The, the other part is, uh, for, for me always, it's a, it's a thing of uh, integrity. You, you are going to, whether you like it or not, somewhere along the line, you'll get a phone call or an email or something to do with another business while at work. And we have to respect our, our, our companies, even if they don't always respect us. Uh, I know that's a, a big topic on its own as well. But we must always still respect the people who put the food on our table at the end of the day. There are things where you don't really have to. Uh, I, and, and I don't always look at the negative part of it. When, when I decided to move into the coaching, um, I was in a very, very, very well-paying job uh, in Zambia. And at the time I spoke to the directors of the company and explained to them what was going on in my life and what I was trying to do. And they allowed me to carry on at the same salary, working half time so that I could pursue my business. So there's always that possibility that they can support you. Just, just be careful, and, and that really is the only thing. It's, it's about the integrity and your respect to them, and then the legal part of it, that they can shut you down if it is in contradiction to your contract. Oh, very good point. And I think also where um, some companies as well, um, if you're good, um, 
in certain opportunities. You can also find yourself um, having to come up with ideas for a side hustle, which might still be claimed by the company. So like patent holding. Um, so some, so always read mm. back your contract as well for your employment because some for places sure. will tell you if you come up with an idea while you're working for us, we own that idea. So mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of yeah, IT exactly. companies do that. <laughs> Okay. Yes. No, that's and Terrell, true. do you want to read the next question? I think there was a question that came up. Um, yes. Um, the, the next one is, it doesn't feel organic uh, to me to, to be posting on social media every day. Is it okay to get someone else to market? Yes, definitely. If you can afford it. The guys generally, the professionals who do that, um, they are not cheap. Uh, I know one of the people I approached, uh, they were charging 15,000 Rand a month. Now, if you have that kind of funding, by all means, do it. But you need to decide whether uh, the time you're going to spend on creating ads and posts, which is not as easy as most people think it is, um, whether that is worth in money what you would be paying someone else. So there's nothing wrong in finding someone to do it for you. Even better, if you find someone who's trying to start a side hustle in marketing, you could be the, the guinea pig, right? There Let them go. use you to promote them so they can do work for you while promoting themselves. So, so think outside the box. Don't, don't be limited by, uh, <laughs> by the traditional ways of doing things. Excellent idea. So that's where, especially if you can't afford to do a lot of things, find ways <laughs> to kind of do exchange or mm. bartering um, type of yes. approach. Because when you don't have a rich uncle, rich hubby, um, <laughs> definitely there are lots of people who are trying to start certain businesses and you can be their guinea pig and um, just allow that to be. And you'll find that some people are really good at it and then mm -hmm. you, or they're really making mistakes. Um, don't be afraid to give feedback. So I think um, just um, another last point is really just about feedback. You know, don't be afraid to receive feedback on how you're doing with the side hustle, solicit feedback. And a lot of companies have improved um, because they're constantly working through the feedback. So whether it's a customer satisfaction rating, um, mm -hmm. always explore the fact that what if my service doesn't get delivered the way that they want it to be? I always think my idea is great, but what if a client is not happy with the service that I give them? So what do I do? So how do I respond to um, maybe where I missed a deadline. I promised to mm. deliver at a deadline and I missed that deadline. How do I keep the trust factor and how do I, um, am I vulnerable enough to receive feedback? <laughs> um, so Carol, how do we approach that? <laughs> That's not an easy one. It's, it's, you know, I put it sort of in the same thing as going out there and selling your product. But guys like Mercedes Benz, their cars are not where they are because nobody gave them feedback. People complained that this thing broke too quickly or this, was, this looked cheap and this looks just like another car. So the only way we can grow uh, in our products and our business and ourselves is through constant feedback. It's about communication. Even in your relationship, if you, if you don't pay attention in your relationship and yeah. take the feedback that is there, pick up your socks mm -hmm. off the floor, you know, don't squeeze the toothpaste in the center, eventually that grows into something bigger. So listen to the feedback and, and take it as constructive criticism. There will always be people that just want to hurt you. They will always be there, just brush them off. But listen, assess what is being said to you. Look at what you've done wrong, if, if it is that you missed the deadline. What caused you to miss the deadline? And then don't, yeah. uh, don't just ignore the client. Uh, people, uh, my daughter comes and Daddy, you blue ticked me. Don't blue tick them if they send you a, a WhatsApp. <laughs> communicate yeah. with them, apologize, say, look, we know where the problem was. We've identified it, we fixed it, it won't happen again. Um, yeah. Just, it's, it's about that communication. Wow. So thanks, Carol. And so the Jackie's asking, maybe this is subjective, but what if the job is frustrating and one does not have peace about it? Is it better to quit and go after the hustle full time or would it be a regrettable decision later on? And then another point was when you talked about passion inside hustle, there are times when people do something they don't like to get where they want to. Do you have experience in this? Okay, so um, I'll answer the, um, the first question. Mm -hmm. She's talking about the frustration. So one thing that I did with one individual were judging their business plan and they actually were qualifying to be the top three 
candidates for their business idea. And they worked for a consulting firm and they had you know, a small daughter and they just moved house. So then the question was, okay, if you, move, if you quit your job, will you be able to pay for your mortgage payments, send your daughter to the school that you're sending her to and mm -hmm. keep the car, just the, just the basics of living, right? And then she says, no, I won't be able to. But at the beginning of the interview, she was saying, I'm ready to quit my job. So it was really mm -hmm. just as judges, we were giving a feedback to say, don't quit your day job, maybe give it a three more years while you ramp down um, working full time and then ramp up the side hustle. So if the income is coming in, it's consistent and sustainable, then obviously um, do that. Or you might decide to sell your home, sell your car, move in with your parents and focus on your side hustle. So that's where, what price is it going to cost you? And I think that's where a lot of people have regretted the decision of taking a side hustle. And uh, there was an individual I met at one point, he was a father with children and this guy told him about this investment side gig and he went full on in it and then before you know it they lost their home they were you know living with parents and he regretted it and it was more around where he had to forgive himself for doing that um, because he really mm -hmm. hadn't done his homework and then the times when you will face mm -hmm. um, slumps in your side hustle so it doesn't mean you'll always have money but like Carol said earlier on, if you're resilient and determined and you believe in, in, your, in your idea, you'll come back up again if you're consistent to go and be willing to do the nine yard, the long yards in your dream. So um, Carol, do you want to add anything or maybe answer the topic on, on this passion? If you have experience in where you picked a side hustle and, um, and it was something that, you know, you, something they didn't like. Um, to and to get to where they wanted to. Hello. Okay, I'm not sure. Hi, Karel. Sorry, I lost uh, everybody there. <laughs> yeah, We've there had we no uh, electricity since <laughs> four this morning. Um, yeah. Sorry, so I just appeared there. You, carry on, Rebecca. Okay, so the question was really around, have you had experience where you were doing something that you didn't enjoy and then you started a side hustle, um, but you couldn't, leave, you couldn't quit the main job immediately? Yes, I did. Um, the, the, the big thing for me, though, was, and, and you touched on that, is that I would not have been able to sustain my lifestyle had I left. So I was stuck uh, in a position where I had to keep doing what I was doing, whether I liked it or not, uh, no matter how difficult it was, no matter the pains it gave me at the time. But mm -hmm. once you identify that as the means to the end, um, I see someone there saying, that Sophia saying she can't see me. Uh, my host has disabled my camera. Maybe my hair looks bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <I'm very> <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it goes back to your, your, your planning. If you know what you're planning for, right, and what you need in terms of finances for your side hustle, uh, which now has to be your main thing because you are frustrated where you are. Uh, mm. There we go. Now we're back. Okay. Uh, if you you reach that point, we know what you need. Then just stick around like you. But see your day job as the means to the end. Then plan to take out of it as much as you can financially so that you can then step into your side hustle, becoming your main thing as soon as mm -hmm. possible. But to leave it, uh, and, and I did that. I, I left way before I was ready. There's a, a guide with a, or a suggestion where people always say that, you must be able to live for three to six months on money you've saved to start your side hustle. Um, now that's a tough one because most of, most of us live from month to month anyway. Uh, there are very few people that yeah. are so blessed that they can put money away for that long. But I left my, my permanent job because I felt, okay, now's the time. Being over eager and not planning properly uh, in 2014 and I, 2014, 2015, and I stepped out of it. And within three weeks, I realized 
that was a bad decision. Mm. Uh, rent was due, uh, school fees were due for my daughter. I had to eat, I had to pay my gym fees, my car, all these things. So be very clear on what you have and where you're going and then make your decisions from there. Put up with the bad stuff for a little while. When you start your side, when you start your business, side hustle or the main thing, there's going to be a lot of nonsense you'll have to put up with anyway. So learn to live with it, learn to use it to move you forward. Mm. Oh, thank you so much for those words. Um, so without further ado, um, thank you so much, Carol, <laughs> for your input and just being part of this great discussion. So some positive comments that came through already from other individuals who are benefiting from this talk. So over to you, Tendai, as you introduce our next speaker. Thank you for having me. Thank Bye -bye. you so much, Rebecca and Carol. I mean, we learned a lot today and I think one thing that would uh, really help in helping uh, the ladies that are joining us this morning is with starting a side hustle and the decision as to when to leave your job, to stay in your job, you must always remember like to write what purpose this thing serves in your life. For example, with your job, you're there to earn a living. With your side hustle, it's a passion that you want to grow into your side business. But until it's able to sustain you as a full-time business, you must understand that for now it's a side hustle and therefore it has to be done on the side. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing with us this morning. And hi, Sophie, how are you today? I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> Good, thank you. Good to see you. I'm now going to hand over to you so you can introduce our next speaker. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Rebecca and Carol, for that session. That, that was very, very insightful. Like, most of the points were like, I think there are some points that we, I knew I've heard them before, but just hearing them again over and over just gives so much clarity um, and just assurance, especially at the time like this, when you're trying to figure out what to do next. Um, that really is helpful. So I hope everyone who's been watching um, got very helpful insights and tips from that. Um, so our next um, speaker is going to be Vanessa. She'll be touching on basically, especially at a time like this, most businesses are looking towards um, um, doing marketing via online or digital. Um, traditional marketing is, is a bit difficult at this time. So she's going to touch on that. She, she's got so much corporate experience in digital and she also does it um, um, in as a freelancer as well um, and she runs a fashion blogger so she has a lot of experience from the formal and informal space um, so yeah I'd just like to welcome Vanessa to join and I hope you all enjoyed this session Vanessa are you there I can see your mic is open, but I can't, um, I can't hear you. Okay, I can see you now, but I can't hear you. <laughs> oh my god are you using um your your headphones maybe try taking them out and putting them back and see if that will work No. Okay, can you maybe, um, do you want to log out and come back?
All right, sorry about that, guys. Let's let's just um, let's just give Vanessa a couple of minutes um, just to sort out her sound setup. Last but week, yeah, I, and we're waiting for Vanessa to join us. Sophia, I'm going to put you on the spot since you're here and we're talking. <laughs> you have a full time job and you have let's call them two side hustles. You have um, your magazine and then you also have On Your Crown. How have mm. you found, um, you know, your journey ha- starting these side hustles and having to balance between having a full-time job and your passions? I think one of the points that came up um, towards the end was very important about time management. And um, like Rebecca mentioned that you have to like block out time when to do it because obviously you can't do it during working hours because you have to imp- respect the time when you're working for your employer. Um, so it was basically finding time after work, um, maybe fitting in an hour or two to just make sure you get things out the way and also using weekends. Um, so because I'm also studying, I've, I've realized that um, like working at quiet hours, like in the a.m., I managed to do most of my work because I have no distractions or disturbances and stuff. So I also try and use those quiet hours where where I can try and fit in some time. It can be difficult at times um, because yes, I used to love sleep and Netflix and everything like that. Uh, but it's very challenging. But And it's funny that there's someone who who even texted me the other time saying how do you find time to like netflix and and still run all these things <laughs> and and my answer was like i have to i have to find time for myself and i have to find time for the other things that i'm doing so there has to be a balance where i can do all of that um so that's how i've managed to to figure it out so yeah, it's not it's not for the faint hearted, but it's it's but if you're really passionate like with this platform, I'm so so passionate about it. Um, you know me you know today and and, and that's we, we talk and talk. We just we I call you just to ask a question, it ends up being a one hour call um, about something. So yeah, I think like what um, Rebecca and Carol mentioned, like you have to be so passionate about it. Um, and it has to be something you really love for you to be put in, for you to like really focus on it to that extent. And passion plays a big part because um, like what Carol said, you're going to have to put up with a lot of nonsense as well in doing what you enjoy and trying to get your product out there. So it's yeah. not all roses once you start doing it, but you need to have that thing that basically allows you and motivates you to put up with difficult clients that allows you to put up with long days, long nights, not being able to Mm. spend time with friends and family. So it really has to fuel you in having to deal with all these things. And um, I also like what Rebecca said about time. And one thing that I found for myself is it's not enough to always be saying, oh my gosh, I don't have enough time to do this, 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 this. The time that you're sitting there thinking about all these things and counting your to-do list in your head, you could have actually spent that 30 minutes investing in a side hustle or an idea that you're trying to put together to put on paper. You could spend that 30 minutes you're thinking about how you don't have time to actually do something about the things that you need to get done. So I think it's basically having to you know, get out of your head and just put yourself into what you need to do. Good morning, Vanessa. <laughs> oh, we still can't hear you. <laughs> oh my word. No ways. <laughs> Do you want to use your phone? Um, I know you did a presentation, which is so unfortunate. Um, maybe you can connect with your laptop if you want to still do the screen share, but use your phone as the sound. Maybe that would work. Whilst Vanessa is doing that, Sophia, I now have another question for you uh, back to your side hustles. How did you start? 
because from the poll that we did, about 40% of the women here said they're thinking of starting side hustles. How did you actually start? Um, I found that before I became a full-time entrepreneur, I had situations where people would start selling products on the side. Um, for example, you get people selling honey, you get people selling um, skincare products from, from you know, distribution channels. How, how did you know that this was your thing that you wanted to do as a side hustle? I think we have Vanessa now. Can you hear me but now? You to, we can hear you. Maybe mute your laptop. Can, yeah. can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. <laughs> After such a long time. <laughs> wow, guys. Yeah, this was, this was something else. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. It's okay. Um, Sophia, do you I think I can answer uh, that question about how you actually start before we hand over to Vanessa. I think I, I, I made sure that I could hold myself accountable. So I did... Um, what I did was open a Facebook page, like sending it out into the world. And then once you do that, once you create the page, the logo and stuff like that, now you're putting yourself in that position that I really have to make this happen. Um, because I didn't want it to just get stuck in my head or stuck in my notebook. I, know I wanted people to notice. So people obviously will say, okay, you have now this page um, on Facebook, they'll start seeing what it's about, and you're now forced to sort of um, post content and share more information about it. So that's basically like the start of 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 how I did it, and it's the same with this platform where uh, I send it out to the world. Um, I create an event. I thought I was going to get like 20 people who attended, but I ended up getting. Um, hundred people who attended the first event which was I was I was in awe at how many people attended so sometimes um, you have to believe in yourself and take that leap of faith to believe that what you're trying to achieve will, will, will become a reality so that's my experience um, so yeah I think we can head it over to Vanessa I think you're good to Sorry, go. Guys, for those problems that were happening. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. It happens. Okay, so morning, guys. Um, I'm going to be sharing a presentation I prepared for you. Um, I think it would be much better for me to do things this way. Can you all see it? Yes, I can see it. Can everyone? Okay. Yeah. So I'm basically going to be talking on using social media to scale up your business. And um, the first thing that I just want to note is that I want to bring attention to this. I think it was a year or two ago, we all saw this. An Instagram star with 2 million followers could not sell 36 t-shirts and a marketing expert says her case is not Ray. I'm sure we all saw this and this girl she had two million followers and it just didn't make sense why she couldn't sell 36 t-shirts she she's an influencer she starts a brand and her people do not come through for her so i i made it a point for me to kind of you know look into what exactly could have happened from a marketing perspective you see so i just want to bring attention to the fact that Going into a business like she did, depending on friends, family, and followers to just purchase and market your work really is not a substantial way of marketing. In order for you to market a brand, to do anything with your brand, you need to have a marketing strategy. And also, the number of followers you get as a business I understand she's an influencer, but as a business bringing attention to you, you need to understand that the number of people who follow you um, doesn't necessarily equate to people purchasing your product. This is why marketing is such as an essential part of any business. 
it's an essential part for scaling up a business, for just starting up a business, because without it, there's really no business success you can expect. So going into why small businesses need social media. Can you guys still hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. So um, going into why small businesses need social media. The first point is that you can micro-target your audience. This is one thing that really makes a difference. You can micro-target meaning as you start up a business, you know you have an idea of your target market. You've got an idea of what your niche is. So as a person, you already know what type of person you are going for the type of person you're marketing to, the type of person you want your business to attract. Knowing that will put you in a position where you can literally create a specific persona on social media that can help you attract those people. And you do this in order for you to gain market relevance. When you start up, you're competing with bigger brands. And I understand you're not a L'Oreal, you're not a Dove. So in order for you to get that market relevance, you need to know exactly who your client is. And touching on Facebook, you've got different ways of coming up with an audience that you can specifically target your marketing towards. And the first one is a saved audience. With a saved audience on Facebook, you basically handpick your audience by choosing people based on their interests, their demographics, their geographic location, and a couple of other things. These are the people you believe your business is essentially made for. The second type of your audience that you can target is your custom audience. And out of all the different audiences that you can have, this is the most high value. Why? This is because it's targeted at people who have already interacted with your business before. So you know these are people who have visited your website, people who have interacted with you on an app, if you've got an app, or they've interacted with your Facebook content, your Instagram content, your Twitter content, one place or another. These are people who have already shown interest in your business. So targeting this group of people will basically bring you more success and better results. Um, okay. And then the last one is a lookalike audience. So in order for you to have a lookalike audience, you need to first of all have come up with a saved audience, which is the first one I spoke about. Saved audience, we say that's the first one, that's the, the client you're expecting your business to target. And then with the lookalike, you are helping your Facebook marketing pick out people who are similar to the ones who are already, the ones that you're already trying to attract that you believe your business is made for. And essentially that just means you're going for basically the same type of people, the same type of persona. And it brings much, much relevance to your page because you're not really going out of your way to look for, to kind of do a market research to figure out who exactly I need. You have an idea of who it is. You're just telling Facebook, please look for other people who are kind of like this, who might be interested in my stuff. And all you will need to now specify is their location, basically. And you get the same type of people coming to your business. And then the second thing is that um, small businesses, social media marketing has an advantage over big companies. And this is because social media effectiveness all comes down to engagement. Bigger companies are not able to interact with each and every one of their followers or just their clients. It becomes a bit difficult to market to all of them. However, as a small business, as a person who is starting up, you've got that advantage because with your first 500 followers, you are still able to respond to each comment. You're still able to give each and every person a personalized experience of what your business is about. And believe you me, people want that type of experience. They want that personal experience. And as a small business, once you do that from the beginning, going forward, your marketing is not going to be difficult. 
word of mouth will move you from there because once somebody has had a good experience with you, you've given them, you've given them your time, you've given them the answers, you've responded to them timely, they are going to spread word with everybody, everyone else they basically come in contact with. And that just goes down to the next point that as a startup business as well, earlier somebody asked a question to Corral about whether they need a social media manager or anything like that. And he said that if you've got the money, you can go ahead and do it. It's the same thing when it comes to new um, word of mouth is like the new tagging on like social media now. Somebody tags you, somebody uses your products and they talk about it. If you've got the money, and I, I would advise that you at least <laughs> invest a little bit of your money into this type of marketing because the moment you, you scout for influencers to work with or at least give out something. When you start a business, I think a lot of people have a problem when it comes to, to doing something for free. I'm not saying do everything for free, but here and there, if you can, it's a good idea. Partner with an influencer. It doesn't have to be somebody very big. If you saw sometime um, last year, Zara did a campaign and they did a campaign with a lot of smaller influencers. So if you are offering a certain product, try to get a few people that you can give the product to. At no cost, ask them to talk about it. That's word of mouth. And it can really change your whole marketing strategy for you. And then another thing, the last point here is when you're using social media, it helps you build brand awareness. It helps you increase your customer base. It also helps you connect with your current customers. And when we talk about brand awareness, you need to be showing up regularly. You need to be consistent. And also just answering another question, consistency doesn't necessarily mean show up and post every single day. Consistency means come up with a schedule and stick to it. Make sure people know when to expect a post from you, when to expect you to show up. If you're saying that you've got a calendar that allows you to post something or interact with your audience, <clears throat> excuse me, on a Monday, on a Wednesday, and a Friday, make sure that people can depend on you and people can show up on those days at specific times in the, and they have your posts there. And then in order to increase your customer base, you need to know your clients. And how do you know your clients? Market research. And since now you're actually on social media, you do know who your client is, but you need to know the intricacies of what they're expecting out of your business. And in doing so, you've got a lot of things you can use on social media. You've got a lot of tools you can use on social media. Take Instagram, for example, because a lot of businesses are marketing on Instagram. It's become one of those platforms that almost everyone is going to for marketing. <clears throat> on Instagram, you've got stickers that you can use for questions. You can do polls with your people. You can ask a question and have them DM you. Those type of things really help. I know some of you here uh, from my Instagram, and this is something I do regularly. And you need, once you've done that, don't just do it and say, okay, 50% of people say they like this, 50 say this. Go back and analyze which person said they like this part of my business. Go through their um, social media. Get to know what type of person they are. That will give you an understanding of the people that you're already attracting. And just a side note here, just to note, every single business will start with a person in mind that they are targeting. But getting to know your clients will show you exactly who you should be aligning your business with. And anyway, a su successful business knows to adjust from what you expected to what people actually expect from you because at the end of the day you're there to solve a problem as a business and you can't solve a problem to people who are not coming to you solve the problem of those who are already interacting with you and then when it comes to connect to your connecting to your current customers you need to be interactive instead of you just posting and posting and posting about buy this dress buy this that i'm doing 
interact with your people. Do not be, don't, don't act like you're just a robot on Instagram or on Facebook or on Twitter. Be human about it. After all, people want a human interaction. So don't just, you know, buy, buy, buy. And then my next thing is we're going to talk about choosing a platform and coming up with a strategy. And just to note, your strategy solely depends on the objective of what you're doing on social media. So it could be you want to increase conversation, you want to direct your traffic to another website or another platform, or you just want to gain followers and likes. Believe you me, there are people who really just want that, but I wouldn't advise that. <laughs> your business does not grow from just gaining followers and getting likes. And at the back of your mind, always keep that social media is powered by algorithms. No matter what platform you are using, the algorithm, you make it work in your favor by understanding exactly what you want. And what you need to remember is that the more you're present on any platform, the more that platform basically pushes out your work. So as much as I say consistency is not you showing up every single day, showing up every single day does have an advantage. But you need to also make sure you're not leading yourself to a place of fatigue where you're now going to be off for a week or for a day. Because believe it or not, social media people can move on. In a day, they can forget you. In a week, they can forget you existed. So it's all about having a balance. And yeah, you can also achieve this by scheduling your work. Scheduling your work makes you more efficient. It makes you more present. And you are, when you're scheduling, if you are more on Facebook, I had to touch on these three only, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, because those are the biggest platforms that people are using um, in terms of marketing. On Facebook, if you're looking to schedule your work, they do have an inbuilt scheduler that you can use. Um, Instagram, unfortunately, they don't have, but you've got third-party apps that you can use. And these ones, the ones I've listed later, Anum and Planoli, what you can essentially do is you can upload pictures for a month and you can move them around to make sure if you're obsessed with how your feed looks, you can basically arrange everything however you want and schedule everything. And then for Twitter, you can use TweetDeck. All these things just make everything much easier. If you're not for scheduling one by one, you can generally use Buffer, Sprout Social. There are a whole lot more scheduling apps and platforms that you can use. These are the three, the two that I'm personally comfortable with, the two that I use when I'm working with my clients and they're pretty easy, pretty easy. As a startup business, you can generally learn how to use any of these. And you don't necessarily have to take money out of your pocket to pay for them initially. If your business does grow or if you are a startup but you're in the marketing like I am doing myself, then yes, if you're scheduling for more than one account, then yes, you might need to pay for them. But all these, you're not going to need to take any money out of your pocket because, yeah, we are saving money as startups. So here, I just outlined some of the platforms that people use. They Snapchat and the age ranges, as you can see. That's something I wanted to touch on because social media is very effective, but also the ages that you can reach out to it's not more of the older people. And from what you can see here on all apps, it's mostly dominated by women. So if, you're, if your product or your service is made for women, there is greater success that you can achieve here. And also don't dwell too much on the ages. As much as you can see, most of them are just up to 29, which might be a bit discouraging to somebody. But you've got inbuilt insights on your apps. If you make use of those, you will see there are people older than 29 on social media people. <laughs> they are. And if you go into those, you have a better understanding of which client, who are your clients and what exactly are they expecting of you. 
And also, this can help you understand which type of platform you are the strongest on. I'm going to touch on.